uh, Rafael Gamas uh, Bombarelli uh, from MIT. Apologies if I messed up your name. Uh, uh, and I think we're going to hear about some materials work. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity. This, this came as a surprise yesterday. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, really glad to step in and, and sort of talk for, to you about uh, for 10 minutes. I'll, I'll go briefly through my uh, setup slides because I think we all agree there is, uh, you know, AI has made a huge impact in, the, in many tasks, right? Things that we used to think were exclusive to humans have become accessible to sort of computers in an unsupervised fashion, right? We don't need to know the rules. Uh, and it's made a big difference in places we thought were really, really hard, right? A game of Go seemed to be combinatorially impossible, right? And it turns out uh, by judiciously learning from prior results, it was able to, a computer was able to beat that game. And uh, what we're trying to do in, in, in my group and, uh, and a number of other people are trying to do is what, how does this sort of winning look like in materials design, right? And, and why we need this is kind of obvious too for most people. Uh, we need to invent many materials fast, right? Like a lot of uh, sustainability and, uh, and uh, climate change problems are related to our ability to invent and deploy materials fast, right? We need to find the best material for a given task. We need to find it fast and we need to get it to market quickly. And this is energy, energy storage, energy conversion, fuels, plastics, right? We've, we've got a lot of technical debt on sustainability. And uh, uh, the way we see this, and I mean, this is the audience, right? This is, I, I love to, to hear your thoughts about this. But there is a computational spectrum uh, that goes from very rigorous model-based simulations all the way to the black box learning, right? And, and I think we're going to see versions of this arrow throughout uh, all the talks today. So I'm glad I came in early and, 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 and just get to show it for one of the first times. Um, you know, there, there is advantages in physics, uh, and uh, obviously, but I think the, the one of the winning arguments that, that uh, maybe haven't, hasn't been alluded to so far is the ability to extrapolate, right? Once rules are, you know, I don't need to see oranges falling, right? Like, you know, the, the Newton anecdote, right? I, I can regular, I can transfer my knowledge about apples falling from the tree to oranges falling from the tree, right? I don't need to learn uh, physics by example by seeing all the fruits fall until I, I you know, generalize to no fruits. And it turns out with, machine, with, with deep learning models and machine learning models, it's kind of like that to generalize, right? You really need to show them examples to exhaustion. So uh, we operate in this, in this line in the space of material science, as, as do other folks, trying to either uh, inject statistical learning into physics, and by that I mean not having to run expensive simulations over and over. This is what we call sort of surrogate models. Uh, we like dimensionality reduction, uh, you know, we, we do, there was one little box that said molecular dynamics in the previous speaker box. Yes, molecular dynamics is something we do all the time, uh, and there is dimensionality reduction techniques to, you know, track fewer particles when you do molecular dynamics, it's called coarse graining. Um, sampling hard distributions, right, we, it turns out a lot of what we like to do in, uh, in, uh, in proteins, but also in materials, is sampling the Boltzmann distribution, right? We want to draw representative states from the Boltzmann distribution, and when, one of the ways we do that rigorously with molecular dynamics, which forces us to look at the world at one femtosecond at a time. So, a more intelligent, informed way to draw from the Boltzmann distribution that is not integrating the world one femtosecond at a time is really appealing. And this is, this is a distribution that may be learnable, right? So maybe there, there are generating functions that can give you samples from the Boltzmann distribution outright uh, without having to, like I said, integrate over time one fecond at some time. And uh, there is a reciprocal image of that, which is, you know, uh, okay, we're gonna do something black box. We're gonna do a machine learning over, or a big pile of data that somebody collected. Uh, we've seen this is something that performs uncannily sometimes, right? Like alpha fall is the perfect example, right? Turns out, if you gather 100,000 protein structures, it is possible to figure out how proteins fall without knowing almost any physics. I know the physicists went and explained to the mind what they were doing, right? I, I know they, they surveyed the community very deeply, so they, they definitely learned about the physics. I don't know if they used it, but they definitely learned about the physics. They clearly use it. Uh huh? They clearly use it. Of course. Um, <laughs> Um, and of, uh, I think the seminal paper there, or one of the seminal papers of doing sort of backprop over, you know, what, the, what people call now diffusion models, uh, was from Ingraham and Debbie Marks, right? That's, you know, they were doing Langevin dynamics to, to fold the protein in a learnable way. So I think, um, 
how do we inject this structure, right? Exactly that argument, right? How do we inject the structure of the problem or the symmetries of the problem? And again, uh, shout out to Tess. Um, how do we inject the rules of the game that we already know so that it's not just black box learning, right? We know a lot more about the rules of many systems um, than, than just throwing data at them. So I've got it here, you know, and in the middle, we're, we're going to use this to try to, uh, to invent materials. So I got a, a, a small scaboard of, of things we're interested in here in case, you know, we, we connect to the audience and, and throw them out. So very, very little detail, um, but, but themes of, of ideas that we like is multi-scale models. Uh, and, you know, the previous speaker just, just you know, gave us a, a, a great example of multi-scale models with a lot more physics. We just do Hamiltonian dynamics, right? We just move the atoms one, one step at a time following Newton's laws. We don't have magnetic fields, right? Like our, our equations of motions are very simple. We just want to abstract them uh, so we can go faster. Uh, but we're interested in also upscaling the models back again, right? Connecting this, the multiple scales. And, and, you know, somebody said, um, ask the question of, you know, how do you learn noise? How do you sample? Well, if your noise follows some distribution, generative models, there are machine learning models that sample hard distributions. I mean, this is, this is how you get to, to see, you know, this, this uh, uh, generative adversarial networks that give you celebrity faces. So it turns, and that's a very hard distribution to sample. So we can upscale multi-scale models, just like we can do dimensionality reduction, we can do upscaling following the, uh, the, the sort of distribution of, uh, of all particle, of the all particle system as a function of the, of the coarse grain model, right? So in, this, in, in the previous example, this would allow you to sort of sample up realistic uh, interatomic interparticle positions from the, uh, from the reduced functions, right? That follow sort of the right distributions. Um, things, things that relate to that are uh, differentiable models. This is the idea of, of leveraging back propagation to never have to write derivatives by hand, meaning that anything in your physics simulator is differentiable, barring delta functions that don't have derivatives, right? Barring, barring things that are mathematically not differentiable, uh, as long as your, your simulation compounds differentiable functions, you get access to the gradient of anything with respect to anything. So in, in, in this sort of gift that's moving, what we're showing is the uh, learning the interacting potential of a set of particles that makes them arrange in the right the radial distribution function, right? So we've got an array of particles, and we find what interaction potential has the Hamil whose Hamiltonian evolution gives you the right final shape. This is um, the same idea that's also behind alpha fold, right? You're, you're learning the Hamiltonian, the fake Hamiltonian, because it's not energy conserving. You're learning the gradient field whose evolution makes this string of particles arrange into the, into the right uh, three-dimensional structure. And, and this, this is too cheesy, but I, 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 I think there is a lot more here, and I'd love to hear uh, from the audience, in embedding the structure of problems into the neural network architecture. So, so this, is, this is a cheap shot at it. We know the system we're interested in follows a Renews law, right? It has, it has a temperature dependent that we know. Uh, so instead of training a black box model that given a given chemical structure produces the property we care about, which in this case is polymer conductivity for, for to make batteries, we say, well, we know from all our you know, known experiments so far that polymer's uh, conductivity follows a Renews law. So we want to embed that known behavior on top of the black box, right? So we don't know. It's hard for us to understand how structure becomes conductivity. We're going to throw that at the machine learning model. But we do know how the conductivity varies with temperature. So how do we sort of get to leverage the known structure of the problem? And you know, this, this structure is trivial, right? This is, why, this is a very easy example. But how do we embed the structure of the problem into the, lunar, into the learning architecture that we're using, such that we don't need to waste all our data learning the one relationship that we knew already, right? Which has sort of these simple terms. Uh, and this is a place where also, I think, the uh, sparse learning that was alluded to in the previous talk, right? Like the sparse optimization of, of a few terms and the big sort of neural network models uh, don't really mesh today. And it will be very intriguing to see sort of how to learn to pipe really back black box, big, powerful models into sort of these very low dimensional channels that, that we can interpret and, and sort of transform it to, into physical variables. So yeah, this is this is sort of the, the sort of things we're interested in. Um, I I love to think about uncertainty. We don't have anything very intelligent to say about it, but I think 
quantifying model uncertainty and leveraging it is also really important. Um, uh, it's, it's hard, you know, for, for many of these systems, you need to have the full information to train a perfect model. But if you only have partial information, uh, how do you ask your model what extra data it needs, right? So um, quantifying the uncertainty models, both for, you know, trustability and for active learning to, to know how, what extra data you should get to make the model better. Uh, these are two questions that are very intriguing to us. And, and some of these lives inside the model, right? The model may be able to tell you whether it's uncertain or not, and you know there's there's ways to quantify uncertainty in machine learning models that uh, would help one drive towards towards data acquisition. So, you know, apologies for the for the big scatter shot, but I, I, there's a number of things that I, I wanted to throw out there to to you folks. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great overview and all the ideas. Um, I have one specific question, which is uh, generative models in atomic systems. There's many ways to make a generative model, but there's a lot of trickiness when it comes to discrete structures. Uh, what are your favorite <laughs> candidates for generative models of atomic structures, or, or what are your pet peeves about current generative models of atomic structures? This is the, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, so I think folks, um, when they're trying to generate, sorry, when folks are trying to generate matter uh, uh, out of out of machine learning model, definitely the outcome needs to be discrete, right? So it, it's a continuous to discrete problem that has a, a lot of complexity. But there is two types. You know, discovering an antibiotic, it's a graph problem where what you need to draw is a graph because molecules are graphs. So it's not a 3D problem, it's just a graph problem. Which, you know, generating graphs is hard, but it's just a graph generation problem. Uh, what I was describing in, in upsampling in, in reduced dimensionality model is a 3D sampling problem where you need to come up with point clouds that are 3D entities out of continuous, uh, continuous distributions. Um, both have their own challenges. I'll, I'll obviously, 3D our 3D world follows a, a certain set of symmetries uh, that, that people sometimes don't embed, right? Like the Euclidean symmetries. So definitely, a, a whatever sort of generative model is, is being built, it needs to sample the right symmetries, right? It needs to be able to follow the right rules. And in this case, it's, it's a, a E3 uh, uh, equivariance, right? So, and, and again, TESS test is, is involved in, in the first uh, image here in the multi-scale work too. Um, because precisely, right, like we need to embed the structure of the problem, in this case, the structure of matter, which is 3D, which follows a, a, a certain, you know, rotational, a, 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 a translational, and permutational invariance, a, or equivariance. Um, so I would say I don't have a preference for the neural network architecture. You know, we did the, we did a variational autoencoder here. So folks like Gans, uh, flow-based models had sort of a, a big heyday a couple of years back. I don't know if folks are familiar here, but Frank Noe had a science paper on something they call the Boltzmann generator to sample folding states of a protein out of out of nothing, out of noise. So again, drawing from the Boltzmann distribution uh, for for protein structure for different conformational states of a protein. Uh, with a flow-based model. So it, the generative part is, is, we can steal from the computer scientists there. But then the actual objects we're generating have a unique structure that we know. It's not like faces, right? Like it's, it's hard to encode where a nose and two ears should be uh, uh, with, with hard rules. But we definitely know uh, that you know, our, our world has a, a Euclidean symmetry, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, I'm, I hope I'm going to make sense because I'm one of those people that live in the world of graphs, um, occasionally venture into protein three-dimensional structures. So one of the difficulties we're having now, for instance, um, on the AI side, are these latent variable models or more generally generative models that can do property control. So uh, there's a lot of work on now we're able to generate valid molecules, right, what have you, provided that, you know, your training data is good, of course. But what we're having trouble is being able to generate things that matter to us, right? For instance, things that have 
I don't know what it would be in your domain, uh, but some very unique properties. So for instance, for molecules, we may want them to have a good property value in a specific range. And, and even there, the developments from computer vision only help us so much because in the computer vision, it's more like, do you want the eyes to be blue with a combination of brown hair and a mustache or no mustache? But the properties we care about are real valued. I wonder whether there is something like that in your domain and, and just very quickly, like what's on your mind? I got a lot of thoughts about, about molecular generative models uh, and, and, uh, since 2016. Um, I, let me, so I would say, there is, there is two halves of this question. I think generating sort of a condition in your generation or, or pursuing real value functions is not a huge problem from my perspective. And, and you know, back in the day we did gradient descent in the latent space, right? And, and that, you know, it becomes, you end up poking holes in the predictor function. So it turns out all that problem becomes the support of the predictive function. It's very easy to have your latent space go to some wacky territory where the predictor breaks. So it suddenly becomes a predictor problem. You, it's not a generative problem. It's a predictor problem that the predictor is guiding you to this like wacky 27 atoms in a perfect straight line. It's like, wow, well, that looks great, I guess. So it becomes uncertainty quantification, active learning, and, and some sort of insurances, right? Putting guardrails on the predictor so, you know, and, and Jose Miguel Hernández Lobato had a paper a few months back on uh, quantifying decoder uncertainties. Like, well, if I'm going to write a silly molecule, I'm going to stop because I don't even know what I'm going to write. Like, I, I shut up before I start speaking because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say something nonsensical. Uh, and then there is a second layer to me that is we're writing valid molecules, but there is some, something is wrong with them and they're out of distribution. It turns out we, tra we trained on realistic molecules that belong to the molecules that can be made. So they made sense, or all our training data made sense. But then when we start sampling, we're producing unrealistic molecules. They're valid, they have the right number of bonds, but something is wrong about them and they're out of distribution and they're not makeable anymore. And I think the more we focus in the validity, in the formal validity of the molecules, we've sort of lost track on the, they're valid, but they're not realizable. So there's been a distribution shift between the, the training data and the generator. Um, that we haven't been able to address. And you know, people like Connor Coley are, are addressing it by explicitly drawing how the molecule should be explicitly generating the path. But again, I was, I was, this is, I know what places I can get to in the world without having to solve the traveling Selma's problem of getting there, right? Like, I know I cannot get to the, to, to the uh, top of the Everest. There's no route that's gonna take me there. I don't need to try to enumerate all the routes that don't take me there. And I know I can get to my hometown, right? I don't need to know if I'm gonna take this flight or that other flight. So there is something about the distribution of molecules that are realizable, that we're not catching. And I think trying to say how to realize them is more work than, than it needs to be, right? I don't think we need to enumerate the paths to get somewhere to just know whether it belongs to the distribution of places one can get to. <laughs> 